This transmission originated on April 23rd, 2006, and is addressed to the future of America. The man you are going to hear is a whistleblower who is pointing out who benefited from 9-11, what was behind it, the kind of software and alert system in place, and who made the big bucks on 9-11. His name is Richard Andrew Grove. He's an excellent speaker. He's a fearless American patriot. And ever since, Richard Grove has been an outspoken voice, not only against Wall Street fraud, but also for the reshifting of the way we think about and perceive information. Richard Grove, the founder of Tragedy and Hope Communications, has produced hundreds of hours of educational media for those who seek to free themselves from the collectivist paradigm. Richard is a master at reducing complicated propositions into pithy, substantive sound bites. Grove is the founder of Tragedy and Hope, a free multimedia database of the highest academic quality information, ranging from everything to philosophy to economics. So to talk about his personal story and journey to becoming a media revolutionary, I'm joined now by Richard Grove, corporate whistleblower and producer of the Ultimate History Lesson. Thanks so much, Richard. It's an honor to have you on. Well, what I see is something that A, could have been prevented, B, should have been prevented, and C, if the media had done its job, would have been prevented because I understand that if you give this information to people, they would take action to protect their interests. And that's all I wanted to do at the, at the end of the day was to get this information out there so that they could protect their interests before they lost their money and their life savings and eventually their country because the, the frauds add up to a big change that Americans don't yet recognize what this all means. But there's definitely a trend going on. There's uh, actions being taken that all add up to a bigger picture. Picture. And without this connection between ourselves and the public, uh, if we rely on media to do this communicating for us, it'll never get done. So we have to break down these walls and present this information in, in, in ways such that people can comprehend it and then give them the access to go look for themselves. So I didn't, I didn't get into this because I wanted the podcast or any of this sort of stuff. I had created an audio message that ended up being broadcast to the world on a Memorial Day 2006. Panacea was developed in Annapolis in the naval yard. Their office at the time of my being there was on the border of Fort George G. Meade, Maryland, which of course is the National Security Agency. And the current Chief Technology Officer of Panacea is an NSA operative. As you probably know, the NSA is not just one building in Maryland. It's numerous private companies like Computer Sciences Corporation and DynCorp, to whom much of the processing of the data collected on the public is outsourced by the NSA. You could even say to ensure plausible denial. And after that, there was a great demand for, hey, do you have, do you know anything else? Can you explain this? And I did have a lot more to express. So that's one of the first things that you have to have uh, is a voice. You have to have a voice in, you know, through yourself. You have to have something that you want to express. You have to have a need to communicate some valuable information to someone else who might be taken advantage of and lose their livelihood or their life savings or their life. So in actuality, I'm sure it's not a shock to you if I relate that there are many companies through which the intelligence community operates. And like, for instance, AIG, these companies in some cases are household names and openly traded on the stock market. And it's worth mentioning that the NSA doesn't have a secret relationship with AT&T and GTE and all the other telephone companies. Because they are the telephone companies. And there's a 1996 regulation wherein approximately $10 billion of U.S. taxpayer money was used to modernize and upgrade the NSA's ability to monitor, process, and or record every single telephone interaction that goes on anywhere in the country, to say the least. A panacea-like product is used to analyze and determine a risk by processing the aforementioned calls in the context of other data collected. I think that's just a sign that there's so many people in this country. When things can get that obviously irrational, yeah. that there's just no intellectual self-defense, there's no one left to form you know, a sentence, let alone a paragraph, let alone have the power to get it printed in front of millions of people anymore. And that's what I noticed. And no editor would dare print it anyway for fear the ads would dry up. My latest star whistleblower who happens to be here tonight, his name is Richard Andrew Grove. He can attest that a lot of money in gold was made on put options and speculations that day, but he can also tell you how it was done. And didn't you say that they actually adopted some of the software that had these glaring errors that could facilitate money laundering themselves? 
Well, certainly. The SEC actually standardized on the exact software from the company that I was working for. A couple months after I filed my case, I saw a press release from the SEC and my employer, my ex-employer at that time, stating that they had used, they, they're, they're implementing that software that I blew the whistle on that had the back doors to help regulate the markets. And so I just saw that as being so silly that I looked around for what type of investigative journalism was left in this world. And I had taken my case to uh, Lowell Bergman from PBS Frontline. And after a year and a half of working on it, he said, we can verify this stuff, but we can't print it. And like I said, luckily he's here tonight. Richard, where are you? Why don't you stand and take a bow for being a hero? I want to say this to everybody in the news, everybody in the online community, everybody in the 9-11 community, everybody that this kid tried to get that information to that was either too busy, too full of themselves, too full of their ego to pay any attention to it, shame on you. Then I suspect there is something, uh, something very desperately wrong in the state of Denmark as Hamlet would say, in a state of the world, and particularly in the United States, who we supposed to be the harbinger of freedom. I mean, this is the tragedy. Our country really is not the harbinger of freedom. We, we in some part of the world, are considered to be an absolute criminal in our uh, philosophy, in our political ideology, in wanting to conquer the world and creating all kinds of dubious institutions which is set up by the CIA and other institutions which are creating um, terrorist groups and aiding and abetting them. And there's a clear example of what happened in, in, um, in uh, Libya and elsewhere. There's evidence throughout that there's been infiltration of all kinds of groups that are, uh, and so uh, that are uh, not groups that are come out of the country itself, but rather created and organized elsewhere. So, are we improving? And the answer is no. Uh, as a matter of fact, it might be argued that we are becoming worse. I guess the natural question then would be, if somebody is redefining what it means to be an American, and they're using this philosophy, uh, call it collectivism, who might be behind this? Through history, could you cite some cases? So, so the people in the audience who might think that this is kind of conspiratorial, we're actually talking about some deep history here and I'd like to maybe flesh out some of the characters. One of the greatest conspiracies of all history was created by Cecil Rhodes. Of course, he didn't call it a conspiracy. He called it a secret society. Well, what is, if a secret society weren't secret, <laughs> it'd be no, no point in having a, a society like that unless it was secret. And why is it secret? It's because they have things they want to conceal. So it is almost by definition a conspiracy. Anyway, a lot of people didn't know that. I didn't know this when I first uh, became aware of, uh, first, uh, of William Stead's writings of the, the Last Will and Testament of Cecil Rhodes. Uh, Stead was the um, administrator of the estate and all of that. I, my eyes were popping out. I couldn't believe at this. And of course, the writings of, um, of Carol Quigley, the, uh, the professor of history from Georgetown University, who was Bill Clinton's mentor. And all of these things came together. And in fact, I, I see on uh, my vision of your desktop there on your right, the word hope is sticking there. And that's the last part of uh, Quigley's book, Tragedy and Hope. And I think that's what your whole series is about. So you know better than most people how important Quigley's uh, research and, and work was. Richard, through your podcast, The Peace Revolution, you offer a curriculum designed to help individuals be autonomous thinkers by learning that which no college or university can afford to provide. Uh, could you briefly describe it for our audience? Well, what I'm talking about there is a, a process of self-learning that I had to discover for myself. You know, being a corporate worker, uh, working at an you know, enterprise level in the technology industry, working for uh, center, some of these uh, clients that were the largest financial services companies in the world, I found out during that process uh, after becoming a whistleblower and what led me to media production that I needed to do a lot of learning for myself and that on that path of learning, when I find things that are credible and you know unbelievable yet factual, 
I should create the media that you know, shares that. So informally, it, it didn't start out as a curriculum, but over the years, it's the useful information that people are being denied through the traditional media and curriculums of universities, specifically what the theme is through the Peace Revolution podcast, is the fact that you can learn anything for yourself without a teacher by using a method that delivers high degrees of consistency and certainty, and that makes what they teach as far as a compartmentalized PhD, Prussian PhD system, obsolete. What did Quigley do that was so unique or remarkable that no one else had done before? Well, what Carol Quigley, the head of the Foreign Service Department at Georgetown <laughs> University, no marginal school, what he did was use his invitation to be the only human being ever invited to view the files of the Council on Foreign Relations, and I believe its predecessor also. What he did was to actually write a major piece of nonfiction. Must be 1,300 words long, uh, pages long. Fairly small print and he made the fatal mistake of being a superb writer and thinker so that it's accessible to anyone who gets a hold of a copy of the book. That was quite impossible beginning six months after the book was published. And I can just see the manuscript must have been this big. So an editor uh, asked to vet the thing and make sure yeah, 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 and after all, Georgetown, this guy's safe. Out it goes. Macmillan publishes it, sells out instantly, instantly. And any conspiracy theory you've ever heard of is documented, only not as a conspiracy theory. Gives you the name, the date, the time, the actual letters. Oh, good God. So it's how they make another brick in the wall. Sure. And that's the craft of masonry. What many people don't know about, about Cecil Rhodes and his plans to create a secret society is that his goal was to change the logic of the United States Constitution in order to bring the United States back into the fold of empire. He says if King George III hadn't been so incompetent, they would have been having meetings in Parliament in New York and England every other year. But the point is, for your listeners, is that Cecil Rhodes devoted almost all of his vast wealth to the creation of a secret society. And the purpose of this secret society was to conquer the world, literally, uh, using certain techniques that would not be visible to the common man. This is a good way to get out of the depression, good way to cow dissidents in the population always is to declare a national emergency. Then you have an excuse for foreclosing freedom of speech. If you do look at history, uh, conspiracies are the engine of history. Almost every, every event, major event that ever occurred in history happened not because of some kind of a spontaneous uh, uh, rising of the masses or some spontaneous falling of a boulder that happened to hit somebody over the head. No, these were planned and usually they were planned in secret and everybody should know that. Anybody that scoffs at the idea of of conspiracy, I feel sorry for them because it tells me they have never read a history book. You find that a secret society of like-minded men stemming from the last wills and testament of Cecil John Rhodes was enacted in order to bring the United States back under the control of British dominion. That was their ultimate goal. And so uh, ultimately you are controlled in almost all aspects of your life. And some of us accept that because it gives us privilege and power and money and status. So this structure has a lot of attraction to it. And this is the attraction of the one percent. I mean, these are psychopaths. And all of us have become some small psychopaths in our respective jobs. We are a sick humanity. There are some wonderful people, of course. There are. The average person, I think, uh, down the street is a wonderful person. But we are what Chomsky calls manufactured people. 
We are manufactured individuals. We are not ourselves. We try and be very much individuals with a pathology and psychology and love and care and humanity. It's there. As a matter of fact, you can see it with our grandparents and their parents, but you see very little with the progress of humanity. So do we have civilization or barbarism? I would argue that we are in the stage of barbarism. We must recognize that. Richard is the founder of Tragedy and Hope Communications, which creates educational media intended to provide individuals with the educational resources necessary to attain PhD level mastery of history and philosophy. Richard, it's a genuine privilege to have you back on the program. Uh, America was created as a nation that cherished and protected individual liberty, yet today it is arguably one of the most collectivist societies on the planet. Uh, as a historian and student of culture and social control, what do you feel is at the root of America's decline? Well, Gary, it's a pleasure to be back. As you mentioned, uh, the cultural phenomenon known as compulsory schooling, the forced schooling, and schooling as a term is the removing of individuality. So what we have as an education system is not really about education, rather it's about removing the individuality and curiosity from students, ruining the integrity of their minds. And psychological warfare is simply a population that is willing to believe things that are not true and they won't question declarative sentences to actually get to the bottom of what knowledge is in that instance. They'd rather believe it, and uh, that's one of the main problems in this country. Little has changed in the past 40 years, except I think maybe the methods that they're using and the, uh, the level of propaganda that's, you know, that, the info war that's being waged on the audience. Can you speak to how journalism has changed in the last 40 years and how maybe you've even adapted and evolved to overcome some of those challenges? Well... First of all, Watergate was not really an investigative story. I mean, that was the presentation to the public because Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein became very famous. In fact, you know, almost as famous as Nixon for tracking down this unbelievable story of corruption in the White House. But in fact, that story never would have been given to them as two cub reporters by Ben Bradley of the Washington Post if he didn't already have it in his pocket. Because at risk was the reputation of the paper, the Washington Post, the survival of the Catherine Graham empire, which included the Washington Post, and associated investments and businesses. So the myth was floated that investigative reporting was alive and well, when actually it had been on the decline for some time even in the early 1970s, and that has done nothing but that decline has continued to this day. Richard, all this has happened without our country being conquered by a foreign rival. How have the values of Americans been surreptitiously changed over the past century, and in what way? Well, I think it's been incremental, and though we haven't been physically conquered by any rival, we've been psychologically and mentally and intellectually conquered in our minds by reverting back to a stimulus response mentality. And, and instead of putting, you know, thinking back in between our stimulus and response, that is our choice to think or not to think in any given situation. When you, outs uh, when you outsource that thinking to someone else, when you believe what they're saying, when they're using a declarative sentence, which is an argument, it is a conclusion, it should be justified by a proof of existence in order to be knowledge. So without that process, that fundamental process, people are left to love their servitude, to be peasants and serfs to a system they don't understand, and they feel trapped as, as slaves should because they're not asking the questions, and the questions bring about a prisoner mentality where you can actually escape that voluntary servitude that we're all bound to through the school system that indoctrinates it and the corporate media that traditionally backs it up. I have a couple notes here about the establishment. Let's talk a minute about uh, Catherine Graham and the legacy of, of the Washington Post in general with uh, Eugene Meyer, Cord Meyer. There's a lot of you know interesting connections there to uh, some banks, some Nazis, uh, some some really uh, you know th things that are outside the public, things that aren't published in the Washington Post. <laughs> well, Catherine Graham was very close to the Rockefeller family, and that's the big point. 
she was given a posthumous award by the University of Chicago, which loved her. That university was, in fact, uh, bankrolled and founded by John D. Rockefeller. You had uh, William S. Paley, you had C.D. Jackson, these are media moguls of the time who worked in psychological warfare during the war for the OSS alongside Nelson Rockefeller and Eisenhower. And when, so after the war, Eisenhower becomes president and C.D. Jackson's in his cabinet. That's psychological warfare during peacetime on the American people. Richard, you use an expression that will be unfamiliar to many of our audience, uh, the decontextualization of history. What is this and what are some of, of the current examples of it? Well, traditionally, history is written by the victors. So history itself is a more of an index to things that might have happened a certain way. But you really need to go out and search out the alternative perspectives so that you can have true comparison and contrast so that you can find the essence of the situation. And only then can you define what's actually going on, who's participating, and talk about anything with substance and knowledge to it. So the decontextualization of history is removing that useful knowledge and information and alternative perspectives that are available to present you with themes of Lincoln or Spartacus or any of the new shows that are out that use historical characters, but don't give you any historical background that is actually and factually true. Rather, they would just, you know, history is not interesting enough for them. They would rather just make things up for the purpose of entertainment and fleecing a public that doesn't resist. And they're not resisting because they're not thinking about it. But if you were actually to think about what you're seeing on TV and the resistance would build up, they would be forced to show us something different at least that's entertaining because entertaining means it has substance and changes you in a, in a positive way for your life afterwards. Otherwise, it's a waste of your time and it's not entertainment. That would be psychological warfare and that's what you traditionally see on TV. And I can't help but notice Rockefeller connections to both MK Ultra and uh, Time Life. So there's Rockefeller connections in Time Life and MK Ultra. Uh, there's Rockefeller connections to Wasson as well as J.P. Morgan connections. So really, what you're what you're doing by studying Wasson or looking into any of these aspects is learning about the economic, political, and cultural history of our country in the past 60 years. That you can see that America has been incrementally socialized to bring about a, a globalist state, and that's not a conspiracy theory, that's a statement of fact that can be backed up by several hundred textbooks, memoirs, and uh, recitations, and citations, and articles of the people who are prolifically and profoundly involved in such agendas. They don't hold a, an American agenda, they don't want self-reliance, they don't want critical thinkers in this country. They have sought to destroy the values of this country by redefining the terms, by taking away the word liberty, from our culture, and we've been taught to think that it's slavery. So when you think that liberty and slavery are equivalent, and you've lost the meaning to those words, there has been a break with reality. And it is that mental illness that is reflected throughout our culture, as long as we embrace irrationality, instead of using that which exists as our metric for truth. In other words, no predeterminations until you see performance. Pierce said, the truth and justice flatly do not exist. This was picked up, by the way, by Oliver Wendell Holmes, who then said truth and justice are what the strongest members of society say they are, and any sane judge decides a case before he hears the arguments, because you don't want to rattle the framework of society. I mean, this is big time <laughs> radicalism. Of course, they didn't see it that way at all. They saw it as nitty gritty truth and all these superstitious, sentimental additions had occluded the fact justice is what strong people say it is. Truth is same thing. So that's an evolution of, of Kantian philosophy where they remove cause and effect and then they, their irrationality can be rationalized. Yes, of course they, le they left out. How do you predict the future? Well, I think the answer to how you predict the future is, is something that you already talked about, knowing the past. Why is history important? History is important so that you can predict the future. If you don't know where you came from, you may know where you are today, but if you don't know where you came from, you have no direction. You can't, you can't draw a straight line yet until you have two points. 
So uh, if people are just concerned about what's happening today, they don't know where they're headed yet. But if you can look back and see where you were 10 years ago or 100 years ago, now you can mentally lay a ruler down there and say, well, okay, this is where we were, this is where we are. You don't have to be a genius to project a straight line now. You can say without fear of contradiction that unless there are some major changes to change the direction in which we're heading, we're, we're going to get to where we're headed, in other words. And so predicting the future is simply a matter of knowing where we were and being very cold, coldly objective in terms of where we are today. And then the rest of it is real easy. It's a, it's a wonderful world, but when I see the gatekeepers, those who are in power, I have, uh, it, it, it makes, it makes somebody who's conscious of this world, this beautiful world, very sad. Um, yeah. And that's the future is calling. The subtitle this describes it a little bit better. The subtitle is, an invitation to change the world. Modest little uh, challenge there, but that's what we intend to do. We will change the world. Well, the future is calling, and this is your invitation to change the world. What, what idea could you express to the audience that you want to propagate through time? One idea. Individualism is superior to collectivism. That's it. Once people really understand what that means, once they understand what is this thing collectivism and what is its constructive opposite individualism, then 99% of all of the issues that perplex people today and worry people, they just disappear, they melt because you can see the underlying philosophy, the justice of your decisions based on, on a truth. And just what truth would that be? Well, you've got to read and find out, but I'll give you one little quickie. Collectivism believes that the group is more important than the individual. Individualists believe that that's nonsense because first of all, there is no group. Group doesn't exist. Group is an idea. It's a mental concept. It's an abstraction. You can't touch a group. You can touch people, but not group. It's mathematical. So if you base your model of the state as being the assumption that the group is more important, the group which doesn't exist, is more important than individuals which do exist. You've made a terrible mistake because someone's going to come along, some leader, great leader said, I speak for the group. I speak for the majority. And you will do what I say because it's in the best interest of society. And if you disagree, into the ovens, you know, sort of thing. It's the way it works. That's my idea I would like to leave out there. Figure out first of all, what is this conflict between individualism and collectivism? And then the idea, the conclusion is, individualism is superior to collectivism. And with all that being said, if you'd like to know more, don't forget to stop by tragedyandhope.com, fly with us on Twitter to stay up to date on thought-provoking news, and download our podcast, The Peace Revolution. Reprioritize some of your time and fill your mind with useful knowledge. That's how you grow in the light direction. Tragedy and hope. It's like putting together a puzzle and what you discover as a result is yourself. Until next time, thank you for tuning in and not dropping out.